Good evening. We call to order the Cleveland Heights University High School District Board of Education special meeting. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Gaynor, please call the roll. Mr. Hines. Here. Ms. Lewis. Here. Mr. Posh. Here. Ms. Serini. Here. Ms. Wright. Here. Before we begin our meeting, um, we need an approval of the following items, a consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I motion we consider the consent agenda. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? Um, I just want to wish Nurse Rose um, good luck on her retirement. I first met her when my children started in CHUH. So I know she's earned it. And I'm happy to see that we've filled up the staffing for both Tiger Camp and Tiger Cub Camp. So looks like we're ready to roll. Yeah, that's a really good development. Yeah, and I'd like to thank all the staff who are will be working this summer because it's something they don't have to do. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the fact that they sign up and do it because it makes a great experience for our kids. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely does. Second that. Important work. Any other discussion? Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Pop. <coughs> yes. Ms. Serini. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Now I will turn it over to Superintendent Kirby. <laughs> Good evening, board members. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am um, pleased to present an update on uh, district climate to everyone. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Lombardo and Mr. Petcat to join me first at the table. Um, the way that we have this presentation organized is that uh, different leaders that lead different initiatives will be sharing um, some updates. So just to make sure you guys get set. And then, Caitlin, are you going to? Okay. All right. So we are going to get started with our work session on climate. One thing that we begin all of our uh, presentations with is the five goals of our strategic plan. Um, I think that climate is an excellent example of how all these areas really work collaboratively and coordinate together um, in order to meet the goals that we have for students. There are three goals that we are want to accomplish this evening as it relates to this work session. The first is we want to review some climate trends in the district over time. We'll set a little context as well about some national and state trends we see around climate. Uh, we also want to share information on initiatives that we are implementing to support a positive, safe, and supportive climate at our schools, so we'll kind of get a, give an update on some of the work, where we are with some of our work. And then we're going to talk about next steps as relates to climate um, in our district. Joining me tonight will be Dr. Gould, Mrs. Liddell Anderson, Mr. Racinko, Dr. Lombardo, Mr. Petkak, and Mrs. Cavanaugh. Unfortunately, Dr. Abdu Sitar had an emergency and could not be with us this evening, but Dr. Gould and her team um, will share her information. So one thing just before starting, I want to set the context of exactly what we're talking about. School climate is a, is a big term, and there are many uh, components to that. I pulled this definition right off the U.S. Department of Education website, where they define climate to be a broad, multifaceted concept that involves many aspects of a student's educational experience. I really want to underscore that the notion of multifaceted. A positive school climate is a product of a school's attention to fostering safety, promoting a supportive academic, disciplinary, and physical environment, and encouraging and maintaining respectful, trusting, and caring relationships throughout the school community, no matter the setting, from pre-K elementary school to higher education. So we'll be focusing on most of these aspects tonight. We'll be talking about safety. We'll be talking about initiatives that we have in place to support the academic, disciplinary, and physical environment. And 
the, the steps we, we've taken to build, sustain, uh, trusting and caring relationships for our students. So to set the context a bit around climate, and this is something that I shared at the League of Women Voters panel in March as it relates to one of the big challenges that districts across the country and really around the world are facing post-COVID. Last May, the Institute for Education Sciences did a survey of public schools across the country. And they actually surveyed them on multiple measures, but one in particular that applies today is what's happening with the behavioral and social emotional development of students post COVID. They note in this survey that 80% of schools reported stunted behavioral and social emotional development in students, a 56% increase in classroom disruptions from student misconduct, and a 49% increase in rowdiness outside of the classroom. One of our staff members, I think, put it best when she talked about noting that we know that students are behind academically two years, at least due to COVID. We also know uh, that students, many students are behind two years from a social emotional uh, perspective as well. And we're seeing, seeing that in our schools. Same source and just noting that there's a link at the bottom for those who want to explore that even more. So the Institute for Educational Sciences notes the percentage of public schools by extent to which they agree that the COVID-19 pandemic negatively impacted the social emotional development of students at their school and by school level. So you'll note, for example, 87% uh, of schools indicated that they agree or strongly agreed with that statement of its negative impact. Uh, you'll see um, similar, similar actually across all grade levels, elementary, middle, and high school. Next slide talks about the behavioral development. Um, one thing that's interesting to note is that the middle schools in particular have the highest percentage of strongly agreeing that uh, COVID-19 negatively impacted the behavioral development of students at, at the school. And again, if you go to that, that uh, link and do some, uh, you can kind of pick different characteristics of schools, et cetera, to see it even more clearly. We definitely note that middle schools have been particularly challenged um, post-COVID. So for this next component, I want to talk through uh, data that comes from the Ohio Department of Education around discipline. And before looking at those numbers, just want to share some, some definitions. <coughs> so we're going to look at the top three uh, disciplinary infractions that districts report to the state of Ohio uh, every year. So we'll look at disobedient or disruptive behavior that leads to out-of-school suspensions. That means an unwillingness to submit to authority, uh, refusal to respond to a reasonable request, any behavior that substantially disrupts the orderly learning environment. There's some examples there. We'll also look at numbers for fighting and violence for out of school suspensions. That's what OSS means. Um, fighting and violence means mutual participation in an incident involving physical violence. One thing that will be important to note as it relates to the data that we'll share is that because we have a new code of conduct that started in the 1819 school year, we also include pre-fighting in our numbers. And I'll, I'll do an example of that, uh, starting with the 1819 school year. And then finally, there's harassment and intimidation. So this is annoying, repeatedly annoying or attacking behaviors using physical, verbal, written, or electronic action that creates fear, harm, an intimidating or hostile educational work environment without displaying a weapon without su and without subjecting the, vi the victim to actual physical attack. So this is where we see bullying in particular uh, represented there. So if we go to the next slide, I'll take us through these links so people know what we're looking at. So in the first link, if you could go there, please, Kathan. This data goes all the way back to the 15, 16 school year. Hold on one second. I just want to. 
put it, pull it up myself. So this data goes back to the 15-16 school year. And so you'll see, for example, in school year 15-16, we had 735 out-of-school suspensions for disobedient or dis disruptive behavior. In, in that same school year, we had 475 out-of-school suspensions for, um, well, th these are actual incidents, not students. Uh, so 475 incidents involving fighting or violence. And then for harassment and intimidation, 34. And you'll see those trends going between 15, 16, all the way through 21, 22. When you see the asterisks by the fighting and violence numbers there, so you see 162 in 1920, 15 in 2021, 350 in 21, 22, and 277 to date, those numbers also include pre-fighting. So you may wonder, what is pre-fighting? Generally, pre-fighting is arguing. So if students are yelling at each other, and it could be an incident that could lead to violence, um, those are, that's also noted and also part of our student code of conduct. So before 2019, pre-fighting was a separate category? It didn't, it, we didn't, it, it, it didn't, didn't exist. exist. So okay. it could have right. been captured in, some, in disruptive behavior, for example, or something like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Liz, just for clarification, is every fight, uh, does every fight also include pre-fighting? Or is, is uh, if there's pre-fighting, if pre-fighting exists. You, it and, could be double counted, yes. Okay, it could be yes, double counted, yes. but there could also be pre-fighting that does not result in a fight. That, Correct. That there's intervention of some sort. Correct. Okay. Correct, yes. And, so, and if, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If there were, let's say, um, 10 people involved in this pre-fight or mm -hmm. whatever, does that increase this number by 10? It's just the incident. It's not the number of okay. number of kids. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, kind of to your question, Dan, I was looking at a disciplinary, just looking at disciplinary infractions from a school and saw um, the pre-fighting. It was a pre-fighting, and then there was a fight too. But they, the students got both. You know, got it. So it, it could have been double counted. Allison, you know, feel free to jump in if I'm not being accurate. But I think I'm on the right track. Yeah. So this, so again, this represents the school district. Uh, one thing that I will, one thing to note, one, we see a big increase from 2021 to 21, 22, um, in all of these areas. And of course, 2021, we were, you know, we had all those different models of education. Mm -hmm. 1920, I would remind everyone, by mid-March, we were out of school. So that's an important caveat to note there. Probably the best um, year to really do some comparison pre-post-COVID would be the 18-19 school year. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll note um, we had less, uh, less disobedience and disruptive behavior in 21 and 22, but we definitely see an uptick this year. And then um, you'll see, you see those numbers for um, the violence and the fighting, the fighting as well. And 18, 19 school year was also the first year of the student code of conduct. So I should have uh, put an asterisk there as well. So the trend that we're really, we pay, pay attention to all of these trends, but we are certainly noting uh, the disobedient disruptive behavior being a really, really big issue. And we see it specifically uh, being a challenge um, in our middle school population. So kind of aligned again to some of the observations that I shared from the Institute for Education Sciences. So just to kind of set that context, if we could go to the link for Cuyahoga County, and there are about 40 school districts in Cuyahoga County, but still just to kind of give a sense, you kind of see similar, you know, an uptick, um, an uptick in trends. I don't have any, any data for this year because that data doesn't get reported until I think sometime over the summer. Um, but you'll see similar, you know, similar upticks for the county certainly um, from 2021 to 21 22, as we saw that as well. Uh, going back to the Cleveland Heights discipline occurrences, okay. Uh, calendar. Two th or academic year, sorry, academic year 2015-16 was 
the first year of Y High, right? When mm. the high school was at Wiley. It was at, if I'm remembering correctly, it was at Wiley for yeah. those two years, 15, yeah, 16, and 16, 17. And we had some issues the first year. And then I'm seeing a significant drop in the disruptive behavior mm -hmm. between the first year at Wiley and the second year at Wiley, but an increase in the fighting mm -hmm. between the first and the second year. And then when we went back to the renovated high school, that would have been 2017, 18, mm -hmm. correct? I just want to make sure I've got that my sounds years. right to me. Okay. Well, I mean, you bring up Wiley. I mean, I think it needs to be said that um, in the high school, the, 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 the corridors were really, really narrow. Mm -hmm. Kids were bumping into each other, and that was right. Prior a huge to. cause. And then two years later, when we smashed the middle schools together, mm -hmm. um, we all met around a table just like this mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. teachers, right. and we had another big um, climate issue that we had to solve. Mm -hmm. um, and that shows up 1819. Because right. yes. heights opened. 1718. So uh, heights we're opened 1718 or 1819. But anyway, the middle schools were at Wiley, and yeah. that's the 753. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in the end, it, it was a good experience, but right. at first it that was. That first year a, was rough. Very well, yeah. difficult for our, for our students. Right. And staff. I mean, I don't. Oh, amen. I mean, it was difficult for everybody in those buildings. And then if we just go to the state line, too, you see a similar trend uh, to what we see in our district. We're in the 21-22 school year, um, a big jump from the previous year, um, 2021 to 21-22, you know, 18,402 uh, versus 83,705. Um, but it's a, it's, there's some similarities in the patterns, even if you go back um, 15, 16 as well. I really wanted to use this data because this is the data that is reported to the state um, and, um, and it also allows us to see, um, you know, see what this looks like across um, other districts um, as well. So if we move back to um, how are we addressing the needs of our students? And I can tell you um, just from my perspective as a superintendent, the summer before last, so the summer after we were getting all really ready to return, um, we started to really uh, think and plan around climate. So if you, you may recall, we partnered with the, uh, the Clingers group, did the safe schools work. We had the safe school advisory committee. Uh, we did vulnerability assessments uh, for all of our schools uh, just to see what are some areas that we needed to work on? Uh, we were looking at even the physical structures of safety in the school as well. Um, and so we have continued some of that work, but I will say that there is definitely uh, more work to be done without question. I think we have the seeds of some good work uh, working, uh, some things that we're implementing, but we're also getting a lot of really um, important information to help make our work impactful. So we're going to talk about safety planning, social emotional supports, multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, we did engage in a secondary school's root cause analysis process earlier in the year, and also training and professional development. So again, I, I offer this information uh, to share where we are, but we know uh, we want to continue to go deeper and deepen this work as well. One thing that um, I did want to share with everyone um, as, as an update, um, Beverly and I had a very productive meeting with 7-9 Union leadership lately, and we talked about the concerns that um, members of 795, but quite frankly, members of other unions um, had as well as relates to um, disciplinary infractions and school climate. So I want to just share some highlights of that conversation here and what our next steps are. The first thing we talked about is the need for staff to have ongoing training with the Student Code of Conduct. For those of you who may not know, our Student Code of Conduct was written for us by the Office of Civil Rights as a part of a consent, a resolution agreement with the Office of Civil Rights um, that we had to do based upon uh, disciplinary practices and data that showed that black students were getting over suspended. Um, so 
as a result of that, our student code of, we developed the student code of conduct, and there are very specific ways that the student code of conduct has to be followed. Um, but one thing that union leadership noted and we agreed is that there's a need for more training on the student code of conduct just to make sure that we're calibrated on its use, uh, to make sure that especially new staff uh, know what the code is, know how to use it, um, and just to make sure that people are really comfortable with that because it is an important tool to support school climate. So we have made a commitment to incorporate training into the district school PD next year. Um, in fact, um, we will be sending a calendar adjustment proposal to the calendar committee and then to the board for consideration so we can have more time for this training as we start next year. But we will go through that process. Um, the consent decree. Resolution you rem agreement, yeah. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, what, when, when was that? Because that was, do, you, do we know the academic year that that, to be, I want to I want to make sure I give you an accurate answer, so I'm going to ask uh, Karen Liddell Anderson just to give us that timeline. So the actual complaint was in the 2014. Got it. Thank you. Hmm? And do we know <clears throat> is that ongoing or is there an expiration for the for the Resolution of that from 2014? Um, the investigation was from 2014 until the 2018. March, the 2018-2019. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the second thing that we discussed uh, was the request from 795 to consider metal detectors in a canine unit uh, for drugs in particular. Uh, so we will be reconvening our safety advisory committee that was in place last year to study this recommendation. Uh, this is something that did come up last year with that committee, um, but we wanna revisit it to see um, if that's gonna be sufficient to address the needs. Liz, I, I was on that committee and I wanna remind um, everyone that one of the things that the clingers um, the school safety network group that we were working with they were concerned when schools put in metal detectors because mm -hmm. people seem to think that they give it a false sense of security and then schools become lax in all the other ways you need to be safe because they think that metal detectors solve the issue and so they were really um, concerned when schools jumped to that as a quick resolution because they said there's always people always find ways to get around those metal detectors whether it's sneaking a weapon through a window um, propping open doors there's all these other things that happen okay. so I just want to be mindful of that, that 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 was it was discussed in that group and there were a lot of reasons why it was um, advised not to jump to that yeah. as a quick solution and we also heard from district families yeah, members uh, of the community. About how they didn't like the thought of metal detectors and how that, you know, what that says as you're on your way into school in the morning. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we know that things have changed. Certainly yeah. the laws in Ohio have changed since then, mm. and therefore the prevalence of guns, unfortunately, is much greater than it was. Mm. So I think we, we, to be looked at. we want yeah. to bring bring it back. We want to see there might be some other screening um, strategies outside of that to explore too as well. Um, but and we'll you know continue to take a research based um, approach to that work mm -hmm. um, as well. You know, listening to stakeholders. Third concern that uh, was raised by leadership was the discipline committee meeting happening regularly aligned to the contract. So. Within the 795 contract, there is specific language around a discipline committee uh, that goes back to 2007. So one decision that we made is to use our monthly summit meetings for district leadership and union leadership meet to uh, discuss discipline. And we also want to ensure that we have the quarterly meetings um, aligned <coughs> to the, the resolution agreement for the Office of Civil Rights. So we are tasked with every month, every quarter, I'm sorry, uh, reviewing uh, disciplinary infractions through the lens of um, equity in particular because that's the basis of the complaint. So we are committing to making sure that those happen. 
Um, they also raised a concern around de-escalation training and really needing that training. We have provided that refresher training uh, to our principals on uh, two separate occasions for them to share with their staff. Um, and then we have particular schools where that, that was a concern in particular. Um, and so we will continue to support uh, those schools to make sure uh, staff are aware of those de-escalation strategies. We want to speak speak to one of those one of the reasons we want to have the uh, calendar change those because we know that we need more time for this uh, for this work and we want to make it extensive and ongoing there is another question around the student code of conduct that's the SEOC in terms of accessibility and training um, and here we talked a lot about just the technical uses of the PLP and the behavior setting log uh, which are uh, tools that are in Infinite Campus where uh, staff are able to note conversations with parents, um, you know, things that they want to make sure, you know, are communicated or we want to keep a record of. Uh, so my team and I will meet with uh, union leadership to really walk through this specifically to see how we can uh, make this an easier process. Um, also reviewing um, any particular coding issues as well. So we actually, you know, in our meeting sat down and went through kind of a sample of mm -hmm. what that was too. It's, it's everything from needing more characters in, in order to enter information to is there a way that the two systems can talk to each other without um, having to put information in in two places. So we'll follow up, we'll do a follow up meeting there. And then the final concern was um, a, a sense that, there, that more school structures were needed for students with severe social emotional learning and behavioral needs. So, for example, in the past, uh, we used to have Bell Fair, where, which was a school that was a part of the district that students can attend. We also used to have, uh, during the time of the middle school, um, when there were some challenges at the Wiley campus, Success Academy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we committed to revisiting those alternative educational models for middle school students. We already have something in place with our options program for high school students. Um, and we also have, you know, Tiger Virtual Academy as well, but uh, we want to make sure that we kind of have a range of, of options um, for students, um, especially during this transitional time where we know that there are some SEL um, needs that students have. Can, can I make a comment about the uh, middle school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the middle school success academy. Uh, I just look at how well that worked when we um, had a lot of the challenges when both Roxborough and um, Monticello were smashed together here at Wiley. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think from, you know, I, it, it's hard to sort of like tease out all the numbers, but a, a lot of the students that um, cause a lot of just a lot of the disruption. I mean, there's a small percentage of students that cause disruptions. I mean, most of our kids are, are not causing disruptions. It's a very small number. And I look at the work that um, Brian Williams does at the high school with his team, and it is amazing um, how you pull out, you nurture, you find pathways. Uh, but it takes work um, to get those kids to a point where um, they're almost mainstreamed, but they're somewhat isolated. Mm -hmm. um, we did that at the middle schools. I mean, there was almost a great graduation because I think those kids that were coming out of that program, we mainstreamed them back into the high school in the end. Um, I mean, they didn't continue on t to options, right. but you know, I just think that it's overwhelming for staff when you're dealing with a very small number of kids. Um, you know, put them in the Success Academy, give them the help that they need right. with the option to moving back if necessary. Right. Don't make it a penalty or anything like that. I mean, you know, that's, that's what was nice about the model that uh, was implemented, um, you know, before that we disbanded because we ended up having good behavior. We, it wasn't needed anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it was really a true problem solver. Yeah. Um, but I would encourage staff to look very closely at that and try to get that implemented to, at the start yeah. of the next school year. I mean, I think that's going to be very productive. I also want to just bring up two things that I see. Um, sometimes kids have, it, it's been too long since kids have tasted academic success. Mm -hmm. and, and so an opportunity like Success Academy could remind them that they can do it, mm -hmm. that there's a, a place for them where 
you know, something is being offered and something was within reach. Um, and I think that that taste of academic success can be a very powerful reminder mm -hmm. for a lot of kids. And then also, um, what I've, you know, what I think we sometimes lose sight of is the impact that these, this handful of kids has on the learning of the rest of the kids. That the, the, the impact that they have in, in terms of diminishing what happens in the classroom can be really significant. Um, and so I, I second your, your emphasis on really taking a deep look at this with always, you know, when a student goes into something like this, the plan is in place for the student to it's come crazy. out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that that's an important piece of it too for the child, for the family, for the, the rest of the community at the school. Right. Well, I mean, there's another piece to it, and you, and you talked about academics, but a lot of our kids thrive in the arts, you know, music, <laughs> you know, visual, they thrive in sports, they thrive in extracurriculars, and I know that it has been a practice to um, sometimes limit those mm -hmm. uh, in this district um, for budgetary reasons. And I think, you know, at the, at the middle school level, we have uh, some buildings that have less options for kids that are non-academic. But that's why a lot of kids actually show up for school. Yeah. Um, they show up for sports. And, oh, yeah, I do my academics, too. And, you know, they... They do okay in both. Sometimes they thrive. They they learn, but they're well rounded. Um, so I think that's something that we need to make sure that we're considering. Again, trying to implement something for start of school next year. Yes, I 100% agree. So we will be working with the team on the structure. And I will say that what you all are shared has also been shared by teachers, administrators, sure. parents, other staff as well. So um, I think we're all on the same page there. We just have to uh, structure it and look at the funding piece for that. So the other piece I want to talk about before I move to the safety piece is just um, I kind of want to share all the different places and spaces where we do do climate planning. Um, so for example, at the, each building there is a TAP team. TAP stands for Teacher Administrator Partnership, and the TAP teams meet monthly. Um, and they are looking at school climate data, discussing school climate issues, um, and then sharing to the summit team, which is the collaborative team of uh, union leadership and district leadership, any needs or questions that they have. So, for example, you know, a school may talk about if their hall pass policy is working. They may ask summit for suggestions. We give them kind of feedback on try this, try that. That's a good idea, et cetera. Every building also has a building leadership team, and every building leadership team has a building leadership action plan. Uh, there is a climate component in every building leadership action plan. Much of it is PBIS focused, uh, for the most part, focusing on how to positively plan for climate. Our principals meetings are held every month, um, and in those meetings we have definitely discussed uh, climate trends, climate ideas, climate best practices as well. Um, in addition, um, I have held collaborative climate team meetings. Now, I want to just share the mistake I think I made this year, just, you know, and I, I really do apologize as a leader, because sometimes as a leader you make mistakes. I went into COVID focused on the high school, or came out of COVID, <laughs> high school focused. <laughs> so biggest kids, biggest school, high schools are always complex. So I think the high school team will tell you that I'm, very much in the weeds with them on climate. Um, and I really thought that K-8 to would, you know, would be fine. And then this year, um, as we started to see um, the data kind of not really change at the middle schools, um, I saw a need to really get closer to the work from a climate perspective. So Dr. Gould and her team and myself, we visit schools, we look at academics and instruction. But I started to look at uh, the actual climate pieces as well um, to see what was working, what wasn't working, how the schools were feeling, all those kinds of things. So I've been at both Monticello and Roxborough doing these uh, just climate-focused visits of late, giving uh, both principals and teams some suggestions or some next steps to take. 
helped me to kind of understand um, also the unique challenges because middle school is very different than high school and it's loud. It is really loud. Um, <laughs> and true. the kids are smaller and they run. So it's, it is different, you know. Um, now I'm trying to, we're going to try to figure out how to stop the running part. Um, but anyway, so it, that's, that has helped me kind of focus. And so in addition to the, I've started doing the collaborative climate team meetings also with the middle, the middle school teams. And, you know, usually at the end of the year, and I did this even when I was a principal, weekly check-ins on climate. Weekly, what's going on? What's going on? So we've started that um, as well with all of our, second, our secondary schools. So we look at data. We look at events. We look at next steps. We look at needs. So I'm very, I'm always asking our teams, tell me what you need. Tell me what your concerns are. Tell me what you, you know, what support you need um, as well. So um, that's a focus that is going to um We'll certainly continue for the rest of the school year, but we'll continue to incorporate that into next year as well um, for this for the schools. It also did, and later we'll get to this, um, you'll see some elements coming out of the secondary root cause process where um, we have some feedback, more feedback on uh, needs at the secondary school level. Okay. Can, can I just chime in for a sec? Because it seems like we're sort of at a break between going from yeah, one I'm piece of this presentation to, mm -hmm. to, to the next. Um, you know, um, I it, in our retreat, this came up briefly, this, the, this topic. And, you know, I can't speak for the board, but I think we're all in agreement to this. This is not okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if I was a board member in any Cuyahoga County school, I would say this is not okay too. This is not an issue that's isolated to Cleveland Heights, but just because other school districts are dealing with um, a climate crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and I will tell you, I would probably think in the middle school areas, I would define this as a climate crisis for us. Um, I mean, the high schools, I mean, when you look at the numbers and some of the, the, the deep stuff that you've shared, I mean, I think we're pretty calm at the high school. There's a lot of mm -hmm. this stuff that's that, that that's thriving. There's a lot of uncertainty in the middle schools and the, you know, but that is usually the case when it comes to middle schools. Mm -hmm. You know, that's sort of the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not okay. And and it's good to hear that you know you you say that gee was I wish I was focusing more mm -hmm. on the middle schools mm -hmm. um, as opposed to really you know putting more eggs in my basket on the in, mm -hmm. in, in the high school. So I, I I'm, I'm glad you're coming to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make sure that we all understand that. And I think the reason why we're here is we're not okay with this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of this is the stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. I, we need to try new things. We need to mm -hmm. look at uh, new ways of, you know, tackling some of this um, and get ahead of the curve. Right. Um, and, you know, hopefully other school districts are trying to climb out of this as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, looking at what other districts do, I think, is a good, is a best practice, and you, you've shared with us some little bits and pieces of, of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm eager to see more, mm -hmm. but I think it just needs to be say that I don't think any of us are okay with any of this, even though this is, mm -hmm. even though this is the baseline and this is what what school districts everywhere are seeing. Yeah. None of us are okay. I'm with not okay this. with any any violence. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, sometimes I think it, <laughs> it needs could be to, ten up there. I would have a problem. Yeah, it needs to. I think yeah. it needs to be said. Yeah. So. And yeah. it's not just schools. Oh, I know. It's everywhere. Oh, right. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, people getting in fights at golf courses and, and Walmart. The, the and grocery store has right, become a dangerous stores. place. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. I totally agree with you. So I'm going to now uh, to turn this over to the team so we can talk more specifically about some of the work we've been doing and some of those seeds that we planted. So turning it over to Dr. Lombardo on our safety planning pieces. All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, this slide is a threat assessment committee. You may have heard of threat assessment or threat assessment planning. And really what threat assessment planning for us, um, it's providing um, CHUH with authority, tools, and information necessary. And I want to emphasize this to be proactive, anticipating, preventing violence on school premises, property, buses, designated bus stops, at all school activities regardless of location. Um, we currently have 90 staff members and a team at each building that has been trained in uh, it's called the Comprehensive School Threat Assessment Guidelines. Um, 
we had a team get together um, at the beginning of the year to really research our board policy, our administrative guidelines, and look at best practices around threat assessment. Um, this threat assessment guide that we've created as a team, um, and there's a threat assessment advisory committee team that put this together, it's based off of the model from Virginia st uh, Student Threat Assessment Guidelines. Um, and, this is a, um, and this is a threat assessment from Virginia um, that was uh, adopted and it's evidence-based and it is proven to be proactive in identifying threats, making sure that they don't become major um, violent situations at schools. A as you look through the threat assessment management plan, um, the committee was made up of board office administration, school psychologists, social workers, coordinators, principals, nurses, and guidance counselors. And it's a comprehensive plan that gives a step-by-step -step approach to any kind of threatening behavior that you might hear or you might see uh, during the school day or on the bus or at any time. Um, everyone has been trained and what this comprehensive plan does is it provides assessments, it provides interviews, interventions, behavior logs, and also an intervention plan review. I will say I'm very proud of our data team and Allison's team, um, Mary uh, Piggott, who put together our threat assessment documents that are in Infinite Campus. Um, and actually the state uh, and the Northeast, um, the ESC that trains everyone, actually reached out to us and wanted to use our, uh, our information as a model. Um, so I'm really proud of the work that this committee has put together. Um, everyone has been trained as of March, and when we got back from spring break, it is with fidelity going on in all of our schools, and we'll be checking on the data um, uh, in the next couple months. And as you look through the, it's a comprehensive, it gives examples of of different types of threats. There's transient threats, which are minor threats, and then there are substantive threats, which are serious or very serious threats. Um, we do have it up on the on the website as well. And you can link through it through the presentation. Yes. Okay. So, you know, I know this is a comprehensive document, and, and you implied that it's um, uh, best practices and used in other, you know, used in training for other school districts. Does, does this sort of make our numbers look a little bit bigger, though? I mean, I'm not saying it shouldn't, but just because we're more aware and we're taking this maybe more seriously because of this kind of protocols, do you think that ups the number? I mean, because things that may not be perceived as a threat in another district, we're perceiving as a threat because we're taking it more seriously? Great question, Jim. Actually, this is supposed to see our numbers go down. So if there's a, it really is. If, if there's a minor, if someone makes a statement um, during a basketball game or during a classroom to another student that sounds violent, you know, it goes through the threat assessment plan and that becomes like a transient threat. Hopefully an intervention is in place and it doesn't move to like a pre-fight or a fight or something even more. So it really is a proactive approach to, to, um, to things of that nature. Um, we will be collecting data. We, uh, this is, uh, you know, we've only been with Fidelity for about a month now and we will be continuing to collect data. But it's yet to be determined as far as our district or our districts if that is the case. But this is supposed to prevent violent um, acts from happening by catching it really early. Okay. That's me. Safety grants. I get to get, give you an update on grants that we've uh, applied for. Uh, our district's been very fortunate. Uh, Sue Pardee has uh, been hard at work and successful at a couple here. So the biggest one, of course, and I think you're aware of, is the one million dollars Ohio School Safety Grant that we received, and we've already committed two hundred twenty-three thousand dollars. Are at work right now for. Uh, camera improvements at uh, the schools that's broken out different financially throughout uh, the different schools so that leaves us about seven hundred twenty eight thousand dollars that we're trying to uh, find uh, ways to spend it and I need to put it that way because if we don't spend it we return it 
So currently I have an assessment done of uh, entrance, all the entrance doors of the schools. If any of them uh, need to be replaced, uh, I have uh, an engineering firm looking at that. We could look at notification and warning systems. Um, we already did security cameras, internal and external warning and uh, signage that's already been looked at. Uh, we just updated some uh, gun uh, warning signs were put throughout the schools. Um, incident command system software, portable radios, and other related safety equipment. So uh, our goal is to commit those funds before the end of next uh, calendar year. We've also applied for a uh, $27,000 school safety grant. That's the Eternal Gener General's Office uh, for vape detectors and uh, OPADA and ALICE training. So uh, uh, Mr. Waters is working uh, on getting that together. Uh, Sue's already applying for that. Uh, we have applied for a Ohio uh, General's Law Enforcement Technology Linking Safety Grant for $20,000, and that's uh, for camera management and camera mapping. What's, you know, cameras in general are, are not preventing anything uh, unless you have somebody actually monitor them continuously. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of these systems, what we're looking at, the management server will actually, number one, make sure the cameras are all working um, and they're looking at the right things at the right time because uh, some of them are pan tilt, some of them are fixed. And then the mapping is set up. It, the company can actually take and create zones so the the person that is managing and monitoring the cameras can sit there and and we have at the high school on 200 some cameras but they can have them mapped out for certain zones like the let say the gymnasium during an athletic event and then maybe the cameras right outside where they can hit one button and the cameras that they are looking for will, will come up immediately so we're investigating uh, those to apply that grant for and we're also looking at a couple other grants, um, the Bureau of Workman's Comp uh, School Safety and Security Grant Program for $40,000. If we're awarded that, that will provide a uh, purchase of equipment to improve the safety and security facilities and reduce or eliminate injuries, illnesses associated with providing educational services for children. And there's another one for $15,000, and that is to help cover the cost of inspections, assessment, maintenance and improvements to indoor heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, as well as the purchase of other secondary devices to control the spread of airborne contaminants. Interesting, but it <laughs> falls under the safety, uh, safety and security. So in, that's, uh, in general, the grants that uh, we have already, which again, we can't thank Sue Party enough. She puts a lot of time and effort into getting those for us. And George, we've assessed that every single one of our classroom doors locks from the inside. Have we conducted assessment? That should be done every day. If, if not, then a work order should be put in. But mm -hmm. we have, I have not, not asked anybody to, to do that personally. I can ask uh, Mr. Waters to make sure that that's done. Okay. I mean, if they're, if they're not working, that should, again, it's a work order. That should make that uh, Okay. I mean, if any of those need repaired, it sounds like that money <laughs> would be available to do that. Just, right. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the exterior doors for we have quite a few doors <coughs> that they need, they need to close properly. So right. I yep. and we currently I mean if I the engineer gave us an assessment over a year ago because I asked him to look forward on this. Um, if we did this the doors that he suggests at seven hundred twenty eight thousand three hundred ninety two dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. That was a year and a half ago. So it will be more this year. <laughs> well, and I need yeah. to get together with him to make sure that. Uh, the grant, the grant, again, the cameras were spent at different schools in different amounts. So uh, Boulevard, we spent uh, $21,000 on cameras compared to Garrity, $46,000, uh, Fairfax, $17,000. So it, the assessment was done by Mr. Waters and the security company that we, we currently use. They went through the building um, with the principals and discussed where they felt they needed more coverage. And then from that, we developed this uh, plan and we're also looking at other areas that can be um, potential areas of breach like where um, loading docks are and things like that yes those are always looked at and we staff 
has been informed that these doors need to be secured all the time and that they are doing that. Another, and one thing that did slip my mind, one thing that Mr. Waters is looking at um, with the replacement of the doors, he, he wants me to investigate the um, film that goes on the uh, entrance doors to protect uh, from shattering. If somebody were to shoot into the window, uh, it wouldn't shatter. Isn't that required to be safety glass already? It is, but a bullet will go through it. Okay, I see. So they make a film now, 3M. There's a few companies a, that right, make a, a clear, film that will go A clear over. coat that just mm -hmm. gets put on the inside. So I, yeah. I'm trying to okay. marry that with uh, doors that need to be replaced at the entrances, but of course the high school doors don't need to be replaced, so I have to separate that piece right. out compared to the middle schools where you know, may have older doors. And the elementary schools. Yes. Right, because some of the doors at the elementary level need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Oxford. Right. Yeah. So, okay. so in your last item, on your last bullet point, vape detectors? Yes. Oh, yeah. This is if we have someone that is smoking in one of our buildings in a bathroom. Vaping, smoking. And we actually are, are piloting two of those right now. Um, we're moving ahead with a pilot program at the high school. Um, that's going to test out a system that uh, IT and uh, Mr. Waters has worked together on. So we, use, we have them in all of our bathrooms at Chardon High School. All the student bathrooms at all levels, school. all grade levels. Uh, just at the high school. At the high school. Uh, I think they may now be at the middle school, but because I was going to say, my experience, it's middle schoolers who so, have a grand old time yeah. trying out new ways to break sure. the rules. Um, absolutely, that's, yeah. that's, well, from that's this pilot program, right. we would use yeah. some of these grant funds to implement mm -hmm. it throughout the I school. I mean, I'm I'm thinking of a solution for the high school. I mean, that sure. would be. Well, no, I mean, I th oh. you're you, you're probably already piloting it I mean yeah we, they've we been know. very successful for us yeah, um, the other thing that that the ones that we have do so it's um, they sense heat they sense uh, really? vape and they also um, they they alarm when there's a, a sharp loud no. noise uh -huh. mm. like you know if sometimes kids screw around and they take their you know book bag and drop it on the on the, and you just get that big pop of books dropping on the ground it is amazing with the settings Sets. i was uh, in a business managers meeting with northeast ohio and there was uh i can't remember the, which school but they had to actually turn down some of the alarms because they were running constantly and it wasn't that a student was vaping or smoking it was one of these nuisance alarms that but back it off. i will tell you this um you know they work for for vaping. They really do work, and and so it's 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 a big step they in the right as direction a, as a deterrent. They work. They, they they report out that when when someone is vaping in the bathrooms, and then it's um, and a, you know an administrator goes and and you have to send an adult in. Sometimes right. yeah. they're you know sometimes the kids are gone. Sometimes they're not. But I will tell you, you know all of these things are just layers of an onion so we have started to log the administrative time that is spent pursuing this because there is now a, a lawsuit against the vape companies right. that have been just like big tobacco marketing to children and so you know we are literally recording the administrative time that's being spent in order to file in the event a that it is successful suit, right. So these um, vape detectors, is it vape and pot, or? The, I should know that. I don't. It's smoke. It's basically okay. the smoke, uh, like a smoke detector, but it also does other things, too. There's a list of things that it can detect. Right, because what you put in your, you know, what's in the cartridge varies depending right. on who you are and how old you are and how badly you I can get that information if you're interested and yeah. share it. Okay. Thank you. I was wondering something about the cameras. Is this we have we have sort of life cycle plans for a lot in our maintenance department? Do you have sort of a, we're going to turn over X number of cameras per year that that we're just budgeting in now at this point, or how are you handling that? Because this we're talking about big numbers of cameras right. now in the district. Yes, currently the system that we use ACTI is ACTI. Uh, and with the high school and the middle schools, of course, those are all new cameras. The elementary schools are updated, I want to say two years before that. So all our cameras are actually in great shape. It's the servers that mm -hmm. need to be updated. Mm -hmm. um, and 
the oldest one I have is Wiley, and it's the older system that once we uh, th there's some potential use of some of the grant funds to do just that. I've been working with Mark Brown uh, and with the security company to sort of identify the servers that we should replace. And I may take and take an older one and put it at Wiley just to keep that one up and running. Sure. That's yeah, still our building, our, our responsibility. Our but we, <laughs> it's, I don't have it in like the five or 10 year plan, but we do, uh, we're updated frequently on the condition of the items. And that's what that one grant that I just spoke about, that monitoring the system, camera management server system, that would actually tell us the health of the system mm -hmm. uh, monthly. We would get reports. So it would help us plan a little better for that. Good to know. So maybe people will be listening or will think about this part of our conversation as a bit scary. Um, why do you need to have so many more cameras? Or 200 cameras is a big number. Um, I think we have, we had 100 at the library. Just I'm pulling a number out of thin air. Uh, but when you're a public building, you got to have this. It's a best practice. And if you don't have it and something happens, we, we be liable. And what's frustrating is when you have it and you expect it to be there and it's not working. So that's right. one of the main reasons we're going to uh, okay. do whatever we can to get this one to make sure our system's healthy all the time. Because even one person to go through all the cameras, I sit there, I, there's three people in the district that have access to it. I do here at the board and they have it at the high school in two different places where you can pull them up and look at them. And daily I'll jump on there. And it doesn't take much for these just to be off a little bit or, or to just uh, the white balance is n not appropriate and it's too white. Um, yeah, and, it, and, and I'll share that the, the company, I, they come out once a year to sit and just go through our stuff, the, the ACTI representatives. And he says he does a lot of work in prisons and we have more cameras at our high school than in any prison he's worked in. And they're outdoors as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we just need to manage them. We need to maintain them. That's what we're going to do. Great. Okay, move to next steps. Okay, and our safety planning next steps. Um, all the work that that we've done with our safety framework that'll be rolled out at the beginning of next year. Um, as Liz talked about the vulnerability assessment, we continue to meet with schools and principals. Um, we're going to continue those meetings in May and June as we move into the summer. Uh, the threat assessment data collection, like I talked about, we'll be looking at the first data collection in June. Uh, we're going to research um, a student resource officer for the middle schools. And um, as George talked about, we're going to apply for additional safety grants. Now, the governor in his budget proposal wanted to allocate $194 million dollars to SRO funding, and there was some peculiar um, uh, difference between what would be allocated for a private school SRO versus a public school SRO. Don't get me started on that. Um, I don't know how much of his initial budget proposal has made it into the current budget bill that was uh, passed in the House yesterday, the day before yesterday. Um, but there may be more money, is the point. Right, right. And the question, you just have to keep up and ask and find out what's going on. Because, you know, the horse trading is happening right now. And you never know what the outcome's going to be. Right. So. While we're there, Liz, can you talk about where we are with our current SRO? program for those watching at home or who we're using initials again because we are in education <laughs> so SRO is a, is a school resource officer and this is um, this is not just a police officer that is assigned to a school this is a very very uh, this is a um, law enforcement professional that has decided to go in as their career as somebody who is uh, you know, involved in the day-to-day -day interactions at a school. It's a, it's a model that's, I think, probably about maybe 10 years old. And it is, um, it's very different than, than the way that it, police used to be inside of buildings. Um, so where, where are we on, on that? I know that there's been some hiccups. Yeah, I'll have Dr. Lombardo take that question. 
Yeah, so we've been working with uh, with both police departments. Um, unfortunately, there's um, uh, there's not uh, you know they're kind of down with police officers um, within the cities um, just because it's very difficult to find uh, police officers. The numbers, are down. The numbers right. are down. Yeah, the numbers are down. Um, so the the Cleveland Heights Police they do uh, provide us with two officers during the day and then we have one officer at night, and they do have a rotation of officers as the time because we try to keep it as consistent as possible. But we are looking to find one person uh, to be that school resource officer um, and build those relationships with the students. We're also working with the university uh, police department as well um, to see if, if there's a way that we can um, work together to, to find um, school resource officers. Right, and, and school resource officers get additional trainings yeah. uh, separate from being a police officer um, so that they are better able to interact properly with kids right and that's a memorandum of understanding mm -hmm. through our board policy with um, that explains all the trainings and and the particulars that that they need to go through right but if the police department doesn't have you know full complement of officers it's hard for the city to give us one <laughs> right. or two or three but they're very responsive and and um, we work well with them um, with both departments they're great mm -hmm. it's a great program all right so we're going to move on to social emotional support so i'm going to ask dr gould and and thank you Bill anderson to transition and i'll talk about mentorship as you as you guys are transitioning um nancy pepler is actually in columbus uh doing some work around the um wellness center at the high school um so i'm going to take a couple of <coughs> pieces of information that she shared so one thing that we know is really important around a positive school climate is uh, students having uh, strong relationships with students. Um, we do have mentoring programs happening at all of our secondary buildings. So for example, both Monticello and Roxborough Middle School have mentoring programs for males that the deans of students run accordingly. Uh, they also have the Students of Promise program at those sites, just like we have um, at the uh, high school. Um, in particular, Pastor Kevin McIntyre at Church of the Heights uh, yes. runs the Monticello uh, mentoring program um, in partnership with Desi Stewart and um, also at Noble Elementary School. That program is going to expand to Oxford um, Elementary as well. Cleveland Heights has many, many mentoring models. Uh, this doesn't even capture all of them, um, but Brother to Brother, Golden Girls, which is my favorite name for a <laughs> mentoring program. <laughs> Uh, students of Promise, Principals Partners, and then we have things like Leading Ladies, which we've had um, in place for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we want to continue to expand these mentorship supports. You know, I, I would love for every student to have a mentor um, that they could um, have as a support um, in the school. Um, I have asked, I know the schools have really focused on those students that we see that have high needs for having specific supports in place um, as well. Some of that work Dr. Gould will, will talk about shortly. Um, in addition from, from, a, from a behavioral supports uh, uh, perspective, Metro Health does provide a support with mental health screening interventions and referrals through the Heights Wellness Center and the mobile units. We also have mental health professionals from uh, Bell Fair at ro both Roxbury, Roxborough Middle School and also Monticello Middle School as a part of the Social Advocates for Youth program. Uh, Family Connections um, is going to be doing a pilot program for SEL for 10 families at Oxford Elementary School. And we have our post-secondary planning system where uh, many of the supports that we have for students and families around health, SEL, and academic needs um, are housed. So I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Gould to take us through uh, additional uh, supports. So thank you. So our social workers and counselors, um, Paul shared uh, about our threat assessment teams. These uh, employees who focus on not just the social emotional pieces, but they also have an academic role. So they are serving on both the threat assessment teams, our MTESS teams, which is our multi-tiered systems of support, which was our student uh, assistance team, which will now be transitioning to that. 
Um, in their work, uh, you will see that they provide social emotional lessons on a weekly or biweekly basis to our students in our schools. Those lessons uh, help kids around how to deal with uh, what they're feeling, how to express themselves, uh, things around that. They facilitate small groups and individual counseling sessions for students. When they're looking at them from an academic and a social emotional lens, they look at students that they may be able to have small group with uh, something that they may have in common uh, and counseling uh, and working with them. They meet regularly with our community partners to ensure that there is a continuum of support. So when uh, Superintendent Kirby talked about our PPS system, they are working with those partners so that they can provide that support uh, for our students. Uh, they partner with caregivers to refer students for additional services. We have a lot of students who may either be homeless that they may be dealing with or also in foster care uh, also. Uh, they assist with developing and implementing behavior plans for students in the schools. They are part of that uh, team that talks about uh, if a student uh, is having some difficulty in school, what does that safety or behavior plan need to look like? And they support teachers in managing difficult behaviors by offering them uh, some suggestions and some strategies to help them in and out of the classroom. So as we think about our uh, supports and our next steps for our social workers and counselors, uh, they will continue uh, to meet uh, on the uh, social emotional learning committee that uh, is held uh, by Dr. Abdusatar as they look for also a social emotional uh, screener um, uh, for students in the schools as well. They will review the levels of support uh, that impact the student's well-being, as well as increase the level of support for students as necessary. This is handled a lot on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on uh, what is happening with the students. And they'll continue to revamp their trauma-informed action plans uh, that help break down some goals and strategies, not just for students, uh, but also for staff, as well as our families um, for social-emotional needs. Next, we move into our multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, we just wanted to provide a clear definition of the multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, as I shared before, this multi-tiered systems of support will be replacing our student assistance team. Uh, we're looking at the multi-tiered systems of support because it aligns not just academic, but it also brings into our behavioral and social emotional learning and also some mental health supports to fully uh, integrate that system of support that is needed for all students. You'll hear a lot of times when we talk about tiered level support, when we're talking about tier level one, we're talking about something that's universal that all of our students would get. And target uh, tier two, we're talking about a more target intervention. And at tier three, we'll be talking about something that is very intense uh, for the students' needs. The current, current status of our uh, multi-tiered support systems, as I shared, is the student assistance team known as the SAT team. Uh, that's what we say. They meet uh, bi-weekly and review student academic attendance and climate data. On that team, you're looking at counselors, social workers, psychologists, the principal, um, and any other uh, teachers who uh, may be uh, discussing a student around those three uh, uh, protocols, academic attendance and climate. The team discusses the needs of students. The needs range from, as we said, academic and behavior intervention, and also the teams determine the intervention uh, needed for the students and progress monitor it. So they are actually providing anyone in the school who may need some strategies or intervention needs uh, for uh, the students that they are discussing. Now we move into our positive behavior intervention uh, supports, and I'm going to have Paul Racinko come up and join me. Oh. Hey, good evening, board members. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. So, um, <clears throat> positive behavior interventions and supports is a research based framework to support uh, pro social student behavior, positive outcomes for students um, to reduce disciplinary infractions across the school settings. Um, it is mandated with House Bill 318 that schools implement positive behavior interventions and supports. Um, last year for our current status of PBIS across the district, we had two buildings um, 
apply for building PBIS recognition with the Ohio PBIS network. Um, from that, um, Roxboro Elementary and Noble Elementary both received the Bronze Recognition Award for their efforts in implementing PBIS. We're very proud of um, the PBIS teams and the building's um, continued work and support in implementing PBIS there. For the 22-23 uh, school year, um, we have building PBIS teams and we have the district um, PBIS team. It's cross-sectional um, um, representation of staff members across the district to, that are on each of those teams. Um, so the building PBIS team, we have one member um, identified to um, attend what is called the PBIS coaching sessions with the uh, state support team three. All right. And then our district meetings, PBIS meetings are strategically aligned that day, the day of the coaching session so that we could apply the, the um, features that we discussed earlier in the day for um, our district initiatives. That occurs on a monthly basis. Um, additionally, to, to really take the temperature of um, the implementation of PBIS, we have two dates throughout the school year, one in the beginning of the school year and one kind of in the middle of the school year, November, December um, timeline where um, our PBIS behavioral specialist and with the support of the SST representatives will um, schedule meetings with the building PBIS teams and complete a tiered fidelity inventory um, with each of those PBIS teams, really focusing on um, implementing PBIS um, in each building with fidelity um, and score, scoring that. So, you know, in those meetings, uh, the, our behavioral specialists as well as the SST, we're really looking for evidence that the building teams have been um, implementing. Um, it's not like, yes, we've been doing it, but you know, we would like to see it. And, um, you know, that is the um, level of expectations that we have for each of those teams to present that information. Um, and then there's also the PBIS self-assessment survey. So um, <clears throat> with the PBIS self-assessment survey, that's an annual survey um, that's provided to staff, um, you know, through collaboration with the building PBIS teams and the district PBIS team, it was recommended that we push that survey a little um, closer to um, the beginning of spring break. So this year we completed it. Um, we had opened from April 3rd through April 14th and then extended it to April 19th so that we could just ensure that we had good representation of staff across um, all buildings participating. So when we're taking a look at that PBIS self-assessment survey, you know, a couple of things come up, you know, globally, you know, with the tier, tiered fidelity inventory as well, that, you know, all of the PBIS teams are making measurable progress, you know, when we're thinking about universal supports and, you know, the tool that we're using to measure how, what the fidelity of implementation for PBIS is. Um, so far as the PBIS self-assessment survey, what's really great about that is, is that that's the, you know, okay, we've been doing this work and keep in mind that the PBIS teams at the building level, you're, you're thinking, well, it's for anywhere from four to six individuals, right? So we want to see that, is that work being translated and internalized by our staff? Okay, because our goal is that we want schools safe for students, we want schools safe for staff members, or, you know, and a very accessible, you know, schools need to be accessible to everyone. So with the PBIS self-assessment survey, we had nice representation across the multiple years that we've been doing it. And, you know, what the staff is saying is that based on the building PBIS team's work that they've been doing, um, we, um, it's, it's been a positive experience. 
So we, there are graphs that show that there's measurable growth being made. And that, that's not something that, you know, four people in a room are um, saying, yes, we made growth. That, but that's, So it's you know, spreading into the whole building culture. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's spreading into the, the uh, building culture. Um, and you know that's that's a huge accomplishment now naturally like just like my investments when i invest in you know you know i, I like to see my investments go straight up right um and it, it just doesn't naturally do that um investments are you know built over the course of time and that's what we would expect with um pbis I, you know what we would all love for you know to, to be there right um, but, you know, we're making measurable growth. Very proud of the work that um, those PBIS teams are um, doing, doing. And um, this year we have 10 schools that um, um, applied or indicated their intent to apply for a PBIS recognition with the Ohio PBIS network. Um, those applications were due May 1st. Um, our behavioral specialist reported, you know, let me know earlier t um, this week that all schools, all 10 schools have applied for recognition again this school year. So that's, um, we'll be awaiting the results of that. Uh, hey, Paul, I, and maybe this is something that Liz can follow up with in one of our uh, weekly reports. Um, can you just share what schools those were? I mean, I'm not putting you on the Better spot right now, the, but if you could, yeah. if you could share. Well, ten schools is everybody. Yeah, all all of them, right. All ten schools yeah. would be all of them. Yep. Seven plus two plus one. Okay, they're all of them. Then. <laughs> if you, unless you separate options. But options would make it eleven. Options would be part of the high school. Yeah, but they're the same the higher end number. Yeah. Um, also, I'd like to see the scoring. I mean, if you can share that with us. Mm -hmm. The tier fidelity inventory. Yeah, I'd yep. like to see that. So um, for PBIS next steps, um, you know, we're looking to really incorporate the recommendations from the root cause analysis committee. You know, that's ongoing work that the district has um, embedded itself in. And, it's fo and um, regarding the PBIS, PBIS teams creating and providing the recommendations to the BLT to um, really um, refine action steps related to um, the building level action plans and the climate goals, you know, to make sure that they continue to be um, embedded in, in those plans. And then the district PBIS team creating and providing recommendations to the district leadership team um, once you know, we definitely receive the root cause analysis um, information. And just for MTSS, we'll continue to monitor uh, our MTSS process as we transition from student assistance teams to the MTSS uh, team. Uh, and we will make sure that school, schools are utilizing their data uh, as part of that MTSS process. And we will be incorporating a data system known as EduClimber that will bring both the academics and the behavioral and the uh, social emotional uh, information all in one area. So this data system that you're referring to, I mean, right now we use Infinite Campus that has behavior and academics built into it. Probably not behavior though, or not probably not social emotional. How does, I mean, would, would this, is this just another stuff that we've got to feed information to, or would it, you know, suck the information that we're already using? It will take uh, the information out of Infinite Campus, and then teachers will be able to manipulate, say, I want to find something out on Felicia. I can look at Felicia's behavior, attendance, and anything else going on with her all in one setting. I can make it do that. So if we've got... You know, a student that's moving from one building or one classroom to another, this is a tool that the teacher can use to see, okay, well, this, 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 this uh, student has had some trouble today, um, and they would be able to know that beforehand. Yeah, it's really to help us uh, make sure that we are providing students with the right interventions that they need. Okay. So if I have a student who I really need to target, and I may have missed... 
uh, targeting them maybe um, for attendance or something like that. Once I um, extrapolate the data uh, together, it'll help me know to really target them in this area. So I'm but, looking more at interventions. Okay, but if someone's having a bad day and you know it, you know they're they're coming into the building, they're disturbed, whatever. Would would because you know maybe something happened on the bus, something happened at home. Um, this is just a way that I'm putting. I'm just trying to think through this. This is just a way that all the students that are going to be all the staff members that are going to be touching that student throughout the day are aware of you know, this particular student is having a bad day and this is why and so they can do the interventions that are necessary maybe I'm answering my own question here if but you, if you're talking about a student walking in and having a bad day I would I wouldn't use edge climber for it I would be looking more so of a restorative practice to okay. look at that student uh, something would be documented uh, in the system, uh, but they would have to go through an entire process um, to really know, I think, what you're getting at. And I may not be understanding exactly what you're asking. Let me think through it and I'll get back okay. to Liz or you, okay? okay. Now, Dr. Gould, will that EduClimber um, data, would that follow the student? Yes. As they, okay. So Crisis Prevention Institute, or um, CPI, um, what it is is it's a nonviolent um, crisis prevention intervention that is research-based and it's utilized across multiple settings, you know, hospital, schools, um, law enforcement agencies, mental health agencies, um, to de-escalate individuals in crisis. So when we think about individuals in crisis, you know, that is not our universal tier. We don't want 80% of our population in crisis, right? So we're thinking about 1% to 5% of our population maybe experience some type of crisis at some point um, throughout the school year. Um, so most of the CPI is really verbal de-escalation, identifying what level of um, verbal escalation they are in, um, recognizing that and providing the correct intervention and strategy to successfully de-escalate the individual, all right? And then, you know, doing that um, across the board. So the CPI trained staff are among several groups. So there's the ALC staff, there's the uh, psychologist, principal, safety and security, low incidence intervention specialists, um, paraprofessional social workers and counselors are all trained. Um, didn't really see a need to train everyone in all aspects of the CPI because remember it's about individuals being in crisis. And we don't, we, we don't um, believe that 80% of our students are gonna need that level of support, okay? Um, so for CPI de-escalation, de um, upon request, you know, building leadership, um, if additional training in like verbal escalation or the crisis development models or other components of um, CPI for disengagement skills to return students to baseline or individuals to um, their baseline is, is required and identified by the building principals. Um, we could go out and provide that training and support. You know, over the course of implementation and including this school year, you know, the bus drivers were um, trained in verbal escalation or de-escalation skills. Um, the lunch staff in several buildings um, as it was requested. And then building staff, sometimes I'll go to a staff meeting and provide this in training in those areas as well for de-escalation and disengagement. Um, which I've received all positive feedback on that. So, um, so for CPI next steps, um, we are adding two CPI trainers from the safety and security team. Um, one of them has already um, completed the training, and uh, the other one will is scheduled in June to attend. Um, so four day training, um, all day long, quite intensive, and then. Um, over the course of 
between now and December, four of our current um, CPI trainers will be recertified. And Paul, can you explain what is ALC? Um, that's the, I like ISS. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Alternative Learning, Learning Center. Yes. Learning Center. Yes. yes. Removal from the classroom. So I think we, if there are any questions on CPI, we can move now to our secondary schools root cause analysis planning as Karen comes uh, forward for that component. Thank you. Thanks, Superintendent Curry, that's the official, Mr. Gaynor, <laughs> right, <laughs> members of the board. <laughs> Good training, oh, dies hard, okay. Well, this evening I'm just going to go over the um, outcome or the summary of the secondary root cause analysis um, in terms of climate. The committee concluded the root cause analysis at the end of February. So if you can click on the link there. Kathan, oh, oh, it's Kathan. Kathan. Sorry, there's a link there at the bottom, Kathan. And you can just go to the next slide. Um, the next slide there, it may be difficult to see, but it just shows you that the root cause analysis committee was made up of district level staff, parents, and community members. The process was a four day process. Okay, go to the next slide. Our task as a committee was to identify the underlying cause or the root cause for the school climate problem. We were to recommend solutions and recommend and propose next steps. Just as a reminder, we use the four-step problem-solving process, and you'll see a guide, little chart there. You can go to the next slide. It just shows you the four-step process as a reminder. Um, step one, we identify and confirm the problem. Step two, we identify issues that contributed to the problem. Step three is where you actually find the underlying root cause. And then step four, you identify and propose recommendations and solutions. Okay, step one, we did identify, you can go on Kathan to the next one, and confirm that the problem, um, we looked at the problem in terms of discipline infractions and that there was an increase between the 2018-2019 and the 22-23 school year in pre-fighting, fighting mutual combat, intimidation, bullying, and harassment. At the bottom there are our student code of conduct definitions of those terms. Next slide, Kathan. Step two is identifying contributing issues. When it came down to the increase of these areas or the areas themselves, the committee identified 102 um, contributing issues. Okay. Just so, so that you know, <laughs> some of those issues were duplications yeah. and they're listed, but they are in no particular order. You can just go to the next slide and the next slide just kind of shows you all of the uh, contributing issues that contributed to that. Something I want to remind um, everyone is that when we were looking at contributing issues in terms of the root cause analysis process, we go through a vetting process where we apply guiding questions to all 102. There are six guiding questions. The number one guiding question is, in order for something to be a root cause that we can address, it has to be something that is within our control. Mm. I will give an example, and that is Root Cause 101. You can go to the United States Department of Education Root Cause homepage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, that is the first rule that vets out the vast majority. I will give an example. Um, you'll see one of the examples someone talked about um, inappropriate music that students listen to might contribute to some of the behaviors. There was another one where someone talked about inappropriate uh, watching of videos and things that they see on, I'm aging myself, things they see on their, their you know, handheld devices, be it at home, wherever. And again, as we went through those six guiding questions, question number one, is that something that we can control? Can we control the music that students listen to that might be influencing their behaviors? No. Can we control the video games or the television shows that they watch? No. So many of these issues were eliminated because our, of our inability to control them. Okay, next slide, please, Kate, then. Of those 102, we were able to cluster those 102 contributing issues down to, I believe that is without my glasses, I'm trying to be cool here, without, there were three groups or categories, but I believe it vetted down to like 18 contributing issues. 
So I'm going to stop being cool and just look at my paper. <laughs> <laughs> like I can see and put on my readers, okay? So if we go to the next slide, of those three categories, they filter down to three root causes. And we'll look at those three root causes on the next slide. The first root cause is a lack of community partnerships and wraparound services that offer support services and resources geared toward the social and emotional needs of students. A lack of does not mean an absence of. So we just want to point that out. The second root cause is that all school level staff is not trained in the use of conflict resolution and de-escalation techniques and or strategies and all students are not taught conflict resolution skills. And the third root cause, PBIS is not fully executed or implemented with fidelity across the district and all pre-K through 12 schools. So these were the three categories that the 102 contributing issues had filtered down to 18 contributing issues that fell into these three categories. May I ask when we started the PBIS implementation process? The PBIS, because oh, I know it's a, over so time. Ago. I mean, yeah, we did have House Bill 318. So as a result of House Bill 318, which was, I believe, the 2016-2017 school year officially in terms of the law. So, you know, we've been. So then you start fo the following year and mm -hmm. start work through it heavily through that. Yeah, the actual law. But then there was time to, there were various steps and things that districts were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we go on to the next slide, Kate. Then once we identified the root causes, we identified or we proposed solutions, and we can go to the proposed solutions. With the first root cause that talked about a lack of wraparound services, there were 14 proposed solutions um, from the committee. Okay, we go to the next. With the second root cause that looked at training in terms of de-escalation and conflict resolution with staff and students, there were six proposed solutions. And then the next slide, the final root cause that looked at the implementing PBIS with fidelity, there were 14 proposed solutions. So we had a total of 34 proposed solutions across um, the three root causes. You go to the next slide, and then the next slide, as a committee, we came up and proposed next steps. So the secondary root cause analysis committee, our next steps, we had three. We proposed that we conduct an elementary school climate root cause analysis, and that will be taking place on May 4th, 14th, and 24th. The second next step is following the elementary school climate root cause analysis, the elementary committee will propose solutions. Based on those solutions, we're going to come up with the elementary and secondary together. We're going to take a look at district-wide, secondary, and elementary specific mm. solutions. Looking at the number, I think we had 34 proposed solutions at the secondary. We're not sure how many we're going to get from the elementary, but we're going to look at those solutions and see which ones can be condensed and or collapsed, depending on if it's applicable. From there, we're going to prioritize and tier the solutions. You heard Mr. Racinko talk about and um, Dr. Gould talk about our MTS work. So we will be tiering those solutions after we take a look at them across the entire district. Um, in terms of tiering them, we're going to see which ones are universal in terms of solutions, which one apply to all students and staff. We're going to take a look and see which of those solutions are applicable to a target group of students and staff. And then the number gets even more, more so narrow and fewer and fewer when we get to the intensive tier, when we look at all of those solutions. So right now, once we finish with the elementary root cause analysis and those proposed solutions, then we'll take a look at the vetting process with those solutions. And then next, we're going to consider and inc incorporate again those we're going to take a look at the elementary root cause analysis, and we're just going to take a look at whatever they propose. And we're going to incorporate it just like we did with the secondary group. And then finally, we'll present those final proposed solutions to the superintendent. Okay. All right. Any questions? Why the follow-up with the elementary schools? The first meeting was a secondary root cause analysis committee. 
So, and we looked at the secondary issues where they had their highest incidences in terms of fighting, pre-fighting, harassment. Now we're looking at the elementary and there are different um, code violations that were a high incidence code violation. So it's a different committee. So first we looked at elementary, I mean secondary, now we're looking at the elementary. I get it now, mm -hmm. okay. And we have to, like I said, wait to get their feedback, their recommendation, and then again, I'm kind of predicting that some of the solutions will be similar and some can be collapsed, um, but some may be very, very different and unique specific to an elementary school. Right. And then greater social things outside of school will remain outside of school control, you know, still yes. can't change. And it, it, it is a very interesting process. <clears throat> again, there were a lot of um, contributing issues that are valid contributing issues. But again, I mean, we had lots of arguments and we fought it out about the music. <laughs> but unfortunately, we cannot control. It's out there, right? There's nothing you can do. <laughs> or television shows. Um, so right. you will see there's one that even talks about the influence of reality television. It is actually an issue. And I agree 100 percent, yeah, but, but we can't control that. Right. Mm -hmm. So. It has to be within the scope of the Your school district. Control. Yeah. yeah. All right. Can you remind us what the six questions are? The guiding questions, if I can remember, the first guiding guiding question, is this something that is within your control? I'm going to try to remember. The second guiding question takes a look at if you address this thing, will it have the desired outcome? Mm-hmm. The third guiding yeah. question is that you propose, so it's not a question, you propose solutions, and then you ask the question, will addressing, like if you address this solution, will it give you the outcome? So mm -hmm. here's the solution. Then it asks, is the solution something that's within your control? Mm -hmm. And then it asks the question, is it feasible? Mm -hmm. And is it sustainable? So okay. there's just six right. questions. So again, now I remember, step thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I like, is it feasible? <laughs> and the final one, is it sustainable? Uh -huh. And then we always give the example, okay, we're going to get every kid a car so they can get to school. We got this mega grant. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> I want the car sure too. they'd love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but again, is that feasible? Yeah. No. Yeah. Is it sustainable? Mm -hmm. No. Sounds like a great plan, but can And honestly, sometimes we get all the way to the end in terms of something may sound like a wonderful proposed solution. But is it feasible? Yes. And then that last question, can we sustain this? It has to be repeatable, right? Thank you. Because right. we get new yeah. kids in every year. They keep getting older. So if you can't sustain older. it, yeah. and that's why yeah. you'll start out with hundreds of solutions that really get mm -hmm. vetted down. And I think the U.S. Department of Education in this process, they want it to be something that is realistic that you can truly do mm -hmm. and that you can mm -hmm. sustain. So. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, we will be back in front of you um, once we, I'm sure at some point, once we get the elementary results, and we'll share it with Ms. Kirby, and then we'll go from there. Yep. Okay. I have Thank a question you. that's probably broader than oh. just your group, but um, so we know that social emotional needs are greater than just our students. What are we doing to support our staff's um, social and emotional mm -hmm. health? Because, you know, adults have suffered mm -hmm. through the pandemic and post-pandemic as well. So can you talk about what we're doing for staff? So that's what we were talking about. We were looking more at our trauma-informed plans to look more at what are our staff needs. Mm -hmm. uh, our social workers were providing our staffs with some strategies mm -hmm. um, at the uh, staff meetings. They were sharing those out. But we want to look at how we can extend uh, some of that uh, further than just those type of things. Okay, so and we'll our, be taking a, a needs assessment on each of their schools. And I know our medical plan has a employee assistance program. Yes. Are we continuing to promote yes. that amongst our staff? Yes. yes. We're going to make sure we put it in. We've shared it in some of our staff bulletins, but we're going to make it a standing mm -hmm. resource so mm -hmm. people can easily access mm -hmm. it. And then what about, do we cover any SEL on PD? I mean, not, not SEL strategies for students, but S, social and emotional help for staff during PD days? Do we do any of that? We have not done any uh, this school year. Okay. Yeah. We've done some uh, SEL, social emotional things in the past, but during this particular school year, we did not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other than, like I said, at the staff meetings, just providing strategies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, training and professional development. 
Um, we uh, have talked a lot about uh, restorative. Uh, and when we first began restorative uh, training, it was during the time where our schools were at Wiley. Uh, and both middle schools were together at Wiley. So we really looked a lot at our secondary schools uh, to look at um, three things. How do we promote a positive culture for them? Uh, looking at increased equity across our schools where we wanted to really empower uh, diversity and voices to help reduce the discipline and also provide um, some support for leadership in the building, meaning teachers, principals, whomever uh, would come in contact uh, with our students. So as you take a look at the chart here, this goes from 2018 to 2022. Uh, These are the number of staffs uh, that have been um, restorative practice trained in each of our schools. Uh, you will see that uh, some schools uh, have more training uh, than others. Uh, these may be teachers. These could be paraprofessionals. These could be custodians. These could be security people. These ALC, it reaches the entire gamut of uh, secretaries as well uh, in our schools. We have one district elementary trainer. There is an asterisk next to Garrity because Garrity has taken on the restorative practice. They have really, um, um, really embraced it and has made it part of their building level action plan. And so they have uh, worked so that all of their staff members are trained in uh, restorative practice. They make it a part of their beginning of the day. Um, they make it a part of when students are coming back from uh, after the lunch hour to hold circles and actually talk to them. Uh, so they've really embraced this process. So that's why it's an extra uh, next to them. And we have an excellent uh, district trainer that is there, and it's uh, our counselor that is at that particular building. If you look at the secondary schools, because this is where our focus was, you will see that we have more individuals that are trained here and more uh, district trainers uh, at the secondary level. Um, you, uh, each of the trainers that are there, they don't just train for their building, they train across the district. So when we have our district level PD days, these people are used as trainers uh, to assist us. We use people who really uh, are in the field of doing that type of practice. So I have a secretary that is trained who also trains our secretaries uh, around this so that those questions that come up, they are able to answer those questions from the lens of where they sit. Uh, so there's not, so there's a secur security people, they're trained, so we would have security people doing that. ALC, the same thing. So as we move uh, next into our equity training, and the restorative fits right into that. Because with restorative, as I shared, you're empowering people to have that diversity in their voice. So as part of our equity training for this uh, school year, uh, and as part of our equity policy, we have really tried to um, take the equity training from the policy, from the district, and now really make sure that it is embedded in our buildings. So beginning in November 21 to March 22, um, our board had a retreat with uh, Dr. Stacy Scott, who worked uh, with the board uh, around policy, uh, equity. And then we uh, went into a partnership with uh, ICS, which is Integrated Comprehensive Systems of Equity. We went into a three-year partnership with them around our equity work and working with our building leadership teams to implement equity at the school level. So uh, the cabinet uh, had a retreat also with Dr. Scott uh, during this time, and we also went into partnership with ICS. We uh, then began to lay out exactly what that would look like for our school district. So in June of 22, an equity institute was held with all of our cabinet leaders, principals, BLT members, and equity task force members. We, the training was held at John Carroll. Because we know that our teachers and everyone are, are very tired during the summer, we turned around and then we held a makeup training, which happened in September of 22. Uh, we provided subs for our building leadership team members, and we actually held the training at Delisle. So those that didn't attend in June were able to come in September. During this time in the Equity Institute, we talked about what that uh, the modules would look like, what uh, people were going to be um, having to deliver to the staff. This is the first time that uh, we've had staff actually deliver uh, the equity modules. 
But what we do with the equity modules is literally the equity task force and myself, we actually go through the modules. We pull up all of the research. We place the notes in there where we need them to be. We actually create some of the activities so that there's, uh, because equity work is very heavy, we make sure that there's activities in there so staff can talk to one another and have that time to reflect uh, during the equity modules uh, as well. So during the months of October through March during our PD days, all staff in CHUH, and I say all staff, that means everyone from cleaners, secretaries, staff, whomever, all participated in equity modules one through three. Module one uh, went over the history of marginalization, what equity has looked like over the last 400 um, years and what it has looked like in school systems. So teams uh, at their schools were able to look at the systems that are happening in their schools and how many systems they have uh, for students that are in their schools and they actually had to draw a model of that and actually talk about what that looked like and how it was impacting students. In module two, it was to take a look at deficit to asset based thinking and language. So it really garnered in on how we label and talk about students that are in our schools using words like those, them, special ed, categorizing students. In module three, it looked at engaging in identity development. How do we consider ourselves or how do we identify ourselves? Do we identify ourselves by race, gender, uh, things of that nature? So every staff member went through all of these modules and they're taking this and applying it as part of their equity plan. So in June of 2023, we haven't had this yet, so it's in blue. <laughs> so in 2023, all of our BLT teams have their annual BLT training. It's usually a three-day training, well, usually two days. We're going to do three days this year because on the first day, we're going to do equity module four, and this is how we apply the equity research. How do we take the research that we've learned through all of these things and apply it uh, in the work that we need to do in order to bring about uh, equitable changes in our school. So we will be walking them through the actual module to get them prepared to deliver it to the staff in August. So we will go through that on uh, the first day of our BLT training. So you'll have all your BLT members there, this building leadership team, your principals and central office people will be there as well. So when we think about what has happened um, in those modules uh, also, so as part one, all members uh, have participated, uh, are meeting once a month to actually talk about the modules. Uh, they are looking at the reading that is associated with the modules. They are looking at the activities and they actually plan the facilitation of the model modules as well. In order to help them throughout that process, even though we're providing them with everything, ICS is also providing them with coaching sessions. So they can meet with uh, someone from ICS, talk about you know, what are the things that make them resonate, what are the things that are making them pause. So they have that opportunity to talk out what this looks like, especially for Garrity, Canterbury, Roxell, because each building has a different culture. Uh, as we move forward in this, uh, we will be looking at some of our practices from a district lens uh, as we think about the modules that we've presented and start to talk about some non-negotiables that we need to look at in order to actually implement our strategic plan over the uh, next uh, couple of years. Any questions from that? And we'll have more on equity in a work, upcoming work session. Thank you, Dr. Gould. Uh, last person from the uh, the team will be Kathan Cavanaugh, Supervisor of Communications, who will talk about this work from the communications perspective. We have received some questions just on how, how some of our um, notifications work, so I know Kathan will cover that as well. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Thank you. So I wanted to take you through just a few of the items that uh, my team and I have been working on this year related to uh, school climate and culture, specifically 
um, that are connected to some of the recommendations that came as a result of the uh, communications audit that NSPRA conducted for us um, almost two years ago now. So just to kind of refresh your memory, um, NSPRA, which is the National School Public Relations Association, uh, they have a service where they um, connect with school districts and perform an audit on uh, all sorts of communications happening in the district. So at the district level, um, at the school level, throughout different departments. So uh, we engaged them about two years ago and they provided um, a full report of recommendations for us. So here's just a few of the things that we're doing this year. Um, so we've been focused on enhancing school-based communications, uh, specifically the weekly newsletters from principals to families. So uh, in years past, it's always been a general uh, piece of guidance for principals that they send at least one newsletter to families uh, per week, but this year it was made uh, an actual requirement, or actually within the last two years, it's been made an actual requirement. So uh, their newsletters contain all sorts of things. Um, specifically, they have school happenings, uh, student and staff accommodations, accomplishments, uh, important upcoming dates, opportunities for family involvement and leadership, and of course, uh, resources and uh, contact information. So I want to give uh, kudos to the principals for really stepping up their newsletter games this year. Um, they have been uh, engaging new platforms to put those together and making them a little more colorful um, and on the whole, they're really um, doing a great job with getting those out regularly to families. So I want to give them kudos. Um, Another recommendation that came from the audit was that we uh, create a separate weekly update for staff. So we started doing that at the beginning of this year. So um, if, if you take a look at the weekly update for families and staff, there is a little bit of overlap in information, but the staff one contains information um, that's specific to them, uh, such as important dates and deadlines, uh, as well as resources for themselves and for their students. So that goes out uh, every Friday. And uh, in terms of just some goodwill enhancing staff recognition, um, there was a recommendation that we all loved last year, uh, adding a Rookie of the Year award uh, to the end of the year ceremony. So we are That's doing great. that this year and people are really excited about it. Yeah, so. I saw that come across and I was like, oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. How so to we, recognize newbies who've like just jumped in and yeah, figured and, it out. Right. And there are so many of them. So mm -hmm. um, we're definitely very excited for the end of the year uh, staff award ceremony. We have a lot of great people to recognize at the end of the year. Uh, so switching gears a little bit and just talking crisis communication. So obviously crisis communications can mean a lot of different things, but um, just kind of a high level overview uh, tonight about our processes and protocols for uh, like emergencies and safety and security incidents. So. Uh, when we're talking emergencies um, on a school campus or in a district building, uh, we will keep families and staff informed through um, our platform called Blackboard. So we can send robocalls, text messages, emails, um, using that platform uh, immediately to staff and families. And of course, um, when necessary, we share statements uh, and information with the local news media and um, our partner cities uh, to help keep the greater community informed about what's going on. Uh, so here's a couple real examples. These were things that actually happened um, at schools within the last couple of years. So for instance, uh, one of our school buildings goes on a lockdown due to a safety threat that's happening uh, off campus in the neighborhood. Maybe gunshots were heard or reported or something and the school has to go on lockdown for a little bit. So um, as, as soon as we're able to, as soon as we've got the information, we're sending it out to families and parents and letting them know uh, what's going on, that everyone's safe and, uh, and, and the next steps involved there. And of course following up when the lockdown is lifted another example a school gets a threat on social media and and school either has to be canceled or um, put on lockdown um, or things of that nature so that would be considered an emergency that we would uh, communicate to our community so in the event of an incident that occurred already and um, is over with and presents no immediate danger but should still be communicated with our stakeholders, we'll send a communication to families and staff um, with pertinent info and um, next steps as needed. This is generally an email, but it could be accompanied by a text um, or a robocall as well. Again, a couple of real life examples. So a student maybe brings a knife in their book bag um, or a student pulls a fire alarm causing a building evacuation. In those cases, things are over and done with, but people should uh, still have a right to know about it. So we'll send um, information to families. And if people don't pick up the phone when the robocall calls? It leaves a voicemail, as long as your voicemail's not full. 
it leaves it's, 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 it's not full, right? Yeah. And I, I highly encourage um, all families and staff to uh, make sure your account on Infinite Campus is updated. Uh, you know, if you change your phone number or change your email, it um, you know you're not going to get those messages. So, um, and if you're not sure how, there's uh, some resources on our website, or you can um, call your school and they can help you out with that as well. Or email me; I'm happy to help you too. <laughs> and I'm assuming during you know. Um, whether it's new student registration or whether it's, you know, kindergarten incoming kindergarten nights that we really push registering for infinite campus. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So even if a, a family doesn't have an actual infinite campus account, they're still being put in the system upon registration as far as, um, you know, their name and their phone number and their email address, all of that that they give upon registration. Um, and then creating an account is a next step. So even if they don't have an account, they're still getting messages. But I believe that in order to update those things, you do have to have an account in order to log in if you want to update it yourself. So there's sort of a middle ground here, though, that I don't think we're talking about. And I'm not even sure it's even within your realm, but it comes down to communications. So there is, a, let's say, a, a building policy change that's going to happen. And it's not something on the feel-good side that is you see on the thing where you're cel celebrating staff or making the, the school, school building community aware of something. And it's certainly not an emergency and it's not a threat. But it it could be a controversial or no controversial thing because you're trying because maybe a principal uh, or building staff is trying <clears throat> to solve something uh, and they're going to send a blast out to let's say seventh graders or they're going to send a blast out to, 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 to sixth grade families um, how does that work I mean it seemed like um, do can those staff members just communicate at will um, does it go through your office because um, a lot of times we we and we hear about these things as board members where communication goes out and it's not quite accurate and then another repeated goes out and it still has another mistake in it um, so this is you know I'm pointing I'm, I'm using examples of just you know maybe the worst of the worst when most of the communication is probably very good um, but is there a filter at central office for that should there be um, yeah, I'll answer that question. I think what Kathan and I do um, is we use like that kind of data, like real world, da real world data coming from parent feedback um, to note the kind of training and support we want to provide to staff around communications. So, for example, um, one thing not mentioned, but we did incorporate this year is customer service training because mm -hmm. we were hearing mm -hmm. feedback from email communication, mm -hmm. both to myself and board members, that there was just some concerns around, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, different places in the district around uh, the customer experience for our families. And so we incorporated that, that training. When we see things like kind of a unclear or miscommunication, it is definitely noted. And it's a part of follow-up that we do either individually with principals or their teams as it relates to those things. And then it helps them form like a broader strategy of these are some things that we want to make sure, you know, are clear um, as it relates to the building, you know, as it relates to communication as well. So um, when people reach out to me, reach out to board members, all that information, um, you know, we share that back um, with my team to see where we need to make adjustments around those kinds of things. So it doesn't really come through Kathan, but it comes through me, and I kind of yeah, I get it. With yeah, I just think that there can be some additional support, and I'm not sure where it would fall. I'm not sure where it would be, mm -hmm. um, to help building leaders. Um, but we started address. working on communication expectations, and so for example, uh, you know, one that we that Kathan was reviewing with uh, staff were you know returning the calls or emails within a, I think, 24, 48 hour time period, something like that. Yeah. Because that was the issue, you know, that we were seeing, not everywhere, actually not even in most places, but we wanted to make sure uh, that we were making that more consistent. And so if we see like unclear communication around like building policies and rules, then that could mean, you know, before you send that, uh, something, especially it's a broad, broad change, uh, you know, send to Kate and then put her eyes on it because she's very good at kind of like seeing what's unclear and kind of unpacking was under some of those communications. 
Well, it is like the 24, and, it, and I'm, you know, I, I think that's a great example. I mean, it's just a common courtesy and a business practice that if someone leaves you a message or communicates to you, you get back with them within 24 hours, if not sooner. And if you can't, you find someone to do that or just acknowledge yeah. the communication. Right. Um, so I hope you get feedback when that's not happening so we can reinforce that. Yeah, we I tend mean, to, we definitely do to okay. do get that. Um, and I would say, I mean, I know there's one, as I'm thinking, there's one email that I, that I was like, ooh, I forgot about this, right? So, you know, like you got to <laughs> circle back and make sure, you know, as well. Yeah. But um, I think by and large, um, our schools are pretty good at that. Uh, but we want to get even better. And we are starting to draft, um, or we've already started drafting, um, just a basic set of communications protocols for school leaders, and that is part of it, the responsiveness, um, and I'll continue working on it this summer as well. I've already gotten some feedback on it from Cabinet in previous months, so that's coming soon, so it'll have some helpful, helpful tips and tricks. Okay. Well, I think we have to realize that, I mean, you guys are communication people. You're a communications person, and you sort of have the knack at it, okay? I'm going to send an email. It's going to have the wrong date on it, okay? Without, <laughs> and I've, I'm going to look at it a hundred times. It's just not my thing. Um, so I think whatever we can do to support our staff, um, I think is is mm -hmm. necessary. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, and okay. human error happens regardless right. um, of who you are and, and what your expert expertise is. And I, I hope that I have made myself available to those um, principals or, or whoever needs a second set of eyes. We all need a second set of eyes on things, especially when the stakes are high. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's just some basic checklists, you know, if you're talking about an event, time, date, yeah. place, yeah. you know, yeah. location. Like you right. have to, there's certain things that you need to go through your kind of checklist and go, did I include that? Did I include that? Did I include that? You know? Well, you almost make it a policy. It's like, hey, if something's going to go out to more than 10 people, someone has to proofread it. Someone has to look at it, and someone has to double-check the dates. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, don't send it out. I mean, there's that kind of rules, you know, rule, but, I mean, that's just sort of a best practice that I think anybody would want to do. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I don't want to make a mistake. I want someone to read this, so. Or save do something else for five minutes come back and reread your own work mm -hmm. when you've had a chance to clear your head because when you look at it from scratch you go oh i misspelled that or whatever you know yeah or sometimes you're yeah. taking an old file that you're updating because it's a similar communication that has to go out every year but you forget to update the date or mm -hmm. you forget you know there's things right. that happen and when the day of the week and the number of the month don't line up because right. right, you right. forgot to check that sort of thing and I think that the same policy holds true, just, you know, taking a minute, running it past a, a colleague, that sort of thing, around decisions related to changing policy. I mean, to me, building-wide policy that affects a lot of kids is a policy that needs to be run by the soup. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's how we avoid making real sort of public relations blunders is, you know, to really run things by, you know, up, up the flagpole, so to speak, and then talk about timing, warning, discussion, um, and, and comms. You know, I think that that's a really important piece of it, too, because, you know, when, when significant changes to a school's routines, school kids' days, you know, um, y you want to make sure that um, the, the school's communication precedes the student communication, you know. Um, you know, I, I think all the time, and, you know, we deal with, with buses, you know, because it's impossible to get bus drivers these days. And, and when I'm, you know, at work in Chardon, there have been a lot of a lot of decisions that were walked back around busing and communications around busing um, where it seemed like it made sense in that 10 minutes and it just didn't make any sense at all 10 minutes later so i'm going to wrap a few kind of go to the next slide you can just yep. stay there so just to review uh, what we did this evening, we looked at climate trends in the district over time. Those top three reported to the state, looked at state trends and county trends as well, had some conversation there. 
Um, also shared information on initiatives. So as the climate uh, definition indicates, climate is multifaceted, and that's why you need so many different departments doing work around it. And then um, we discuss next steps in each of those parts around climate safety and security. So I'm not going to read through all of these. I just wanted to make these easily accessible. We have next steps around safety planning that include applying for additional grants, the resource officer research, um, and then uh, developing the school safety framework, which is an extension of the work from the school safety committee from last year, which again would be standards of excellence around safety for all of our schools. Uh, more CPI trainers um, are coming for sa the safety and security team and recertification for current trainers. Um, from the social emotional perspective, we'll continue our monthly uh, collaboration with counselors and social workers. We will continue to look at levels of support and impact on students' well-being. I know this is something our counselors and social workers and staff look at every day. Um, we will increase that level of support for students um, as necessary and then revamp those trauma-informed action plans that all the counselors and social workers have uh, to break down goals aligned to supporting students, staff, and families. For MTSS, we'll continue our PBIS work uh, that Paul shared. And then from MTSS, uh, we have a new data system coming with EduClimber. And uh, we'll continue to look at those MTSS teams to make sure that they are uh, providing that tiered support for students for academics and social emotional learning. Um, finally, from a climate planning perspective, we will be holding climate parent meetings at both of our middle schools. And so this meeting today kind of gives a framing for the district pieces we're doing to support those schools. Um, and we'll also continue to work in partnership with our unions um, on, on the uh, climate areas as well. So I know that we've covered uh, quite a bit. I want to thank, um, thank the team for coming, thank the audience for attending. Um, thank the team for presenting the work and all the things that you do. I know we are, we continue to try to get better every day with this work, um, and we'll continue to continue to do that as well. So now, um, any last questions or comments? Just on that, continuing to work with our unions, does that include, like, helping um, assess what their social and emotional needs are yeah. and mm -hmm. getting their feedback on that? Yes, for okay. sure. Thank for you. Sure. And I know we've had a lot of questions for each part, so the mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we're not good at holding our questions to the end. <laughs> we like to <laughs> ask them in the moment. Yeah. We interrupt a lot. Well, and it's also yeah. something that, you know, sometimes yeah. things just, you need, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you need a minute, because there's a lot of information we just need time to digest before the questions really sort of arrive. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like we are now like we were when we first took on the Title IX stuff last year where, hey, look, this is something we're going to work on. We're going to do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. and, but there's really not a clear recipe. There's not a clear path. Mm -hmm. And um, multiple paths. Well, well yeah, there's a yeah, lot of I different mean, I think, things yeah, I think this is I think this is far more complicated. Um, but I see you guys, I mean, it, it's good to see the work getting done. It's good to see that the root initial root cause analysis was you know in the february january february time frame december. december okay i think that's when the output was so i mean i'm i'm i feel comfortable that you, you guys are working on it um i think we have building specific issues um and i know there's a meeting at rocks um later this week and you have one set for monticello which is equally we good to get that date but before um, the subsequent week yeah you know, so I think there's, um, I think there's things that, you know, need to be looked at not only globally but specific by building. And I know you're very open to that, which is why we're taking the next steps in, in, in individual buildings. Um, you know, I worry sometimes where some of the people that have sort of raised us up the flagpole and are very concerned about it. Um, I mean, you don't see a recipe. There is no magic wand. There is no secret weapon. We've got a staff of a thousand people. I mean, you don't change something overnight, especially uh, a culture of, of an organization. But you, and, but you also can use that as an excuse to take little tiny steps. Um, so I think we need to uh, continually revisit this issue and make it a priority. And people need to see tangible things that are being done that we're, you know, where we're addressing this. Um, 
and I don't mean feel good presentations. I mean there's good and bad with everything. I mean mm -hmm. I think we're good about sharing the good as well as sharing sharing the bad. Right. Um, I like the idea that we're working with the unions on this, and you know they did come to us, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and I really thank Karen for coming to us in a very respectful way. Um, and I think that's making hay. I think she's getting what she needs for her members because of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, and I really appreciate everybody's time tonight. This was this was uh, a large presentation for you guys to put together. Um, especially when we only asked for it, what, a week ago? Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, the root cause stuff is really, it's hard. Yeah. And it's slow, but it's necessary for a big systemic change. And I really appreciate this. You know, this is, uh, this is not going to change overnight. Um, but if it's going to change in a meaningful way, it's going to take some time. And I think it's a good first step, and I appreciate the staff and uh, Superintendent Kirby and you all putting this together. And, you know, I think it's a good first step, and, you know, we'll go to the next because we'll be meeting with the various schools, you know, and to just help to change the culture, you know. And it's not only our responsibility, but it's also a community responsibility. One thing I will say is we... I don't want people to think we're not doing anything right now. So we do exactly. have like some immediate actions that we've taken um, within our middle schools, mm -hmm. both of them. Um, and, uh, but there are longer term, th there are some things that will, it's going to take some time to put Success Academy, yes. you know, like things right. like that. Mm -hmm. Right, that needs um, to be planned but out there are, properly. But you know, we are, the, the principals and their teams are meeting, we're meeting with them, we're kind of, helping them as they're assessing any additional needs to as well. I know that the schools have looked at all of their students and have identified, you know, who needs what kind of support um, to the school year. That's a part of the MTSS process, but I know they, they did a second. In fact, I walked in on a team uh, when I was just doing my own climate um, walk, and that's something that they were doing, um, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, kind of just, again, reviewing where they were and what students need what. And it is that individual kind of student to student support that is necessary. But that's why things like Edu Climber will be helpful because, you know, putting mm -hmm. a bunch of spreadsheets together mm -hmm. can be cumbersome. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've heard from, you know, teachers yeah. a lot. And Liz, is this something that comes up at all at your um, inner ring superintendents meetings? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. All the time. Yeah. So everybody's sharing best practices oh, yeah. about what's working. In fact the vape detectors piece came from um, a, a first ring meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but we were, you know, just the districts were sharing, like, how they're addressing, you know, substance abuse and mm -hmm. different strategies, um, you know, things around uh, uh, cell phones. That was another big issue that we were talking about. How do, how do you address the cell phone issue? Because it escalates a lot of things. It's actually yes. really terrible, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I have a different advocacy thing I want to pursue with the mm -hmm. American Superintendents Association because it's very difficult to get social media companies to be responsive to oh, yeah. district requests to they don't care take things down so right. mm -hmm. um but anyway but yes um you know for the past two years we've really been focused on these pieces mm -hmm. now remind us so that we've got it clear in our head mtss tier one is universal so these Everyone. are the things that help everybody mm -hmm. tier two is the targeted and that's approximately 20 percent or so, so of the population yeah. is that right, yeah. right. ish yeah. mm -hmm. and then the intensive yeah. tier three is 5%. going to be your most intensive right. one to five percent mm -hmm. okay yeah. All right. just in terms of proportions if you're looking at you know a pyramid mm -hmm. um. can we get an update kind of regularly on where you're at with this work um, and you've done that, you know, you did that last year really great mm -hmm. on a couple topics, but, you know, on a regular basis. I mean, not, okay, so we have a board meeting next week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so maybe not next week, but the following. In June. We got yeah, one the, the next following. two weeks, so. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. I mean. We got a lot of meetings coming up. Not the next regular meeting, but the following regular meeting, sure. just sort of where you were at, sure. at with some of the stuff. Yeah. I think that would be very helpful. So yeah, I really appreciate you guys pulling this together in such yes. short notice. I mean, this yeah, is thank you. You know, something that needed to be addressed, and so we shuffled things around and 
really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Okay. To all of you. All right. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming out. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Good night. Oh, oh, call the roll, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Ms. Serini. Yes. Ms. Wright. Yes. Thank you. You can't leave Good until night. we've had the vote. <laughs>